welcome back to Division One Rejects. I am your host, Kobe Manzo. Joined tonight, oh, my co-host, Sir Buzz, has uh, jumped away and <laughs> escaped into the studio. I don't have the other camera set up right now, or you would see him just tearing apart a random toy in the middle of the studio right now. But um, I'm back. It's Kobe Manzo with D1 Rejects. I apologize for the lack of content last week. Life gets busy, and uh, it sucks when I can't do the podcast because I really do enjoy this thoroughly. But thank you for joining me tonight, whether you're listening or watching on YouTube, watching along. D1R 181, the night of October 21st. This is a, this is a special one, man. We've got uh, two guests that I've been trying to get on here for a long time. It's a WIAC takeover tonight. Trey Tetzlaff, wide receiver from UW Oshkosh, just broke the all-time receptions record for the Titans down there. And then we'll also be joined by a defensive back from UW Stout, that being Richie Murphy. Great content creator. Also happens to be a great defensive back for the Blue Devils. And uh, that was a tough one because Jimmy, obviously, being down there at Stout, they beat Whitewater last week and we didn't do an episode. So wanted to get those guys on there to recap that a little bit. Um, but this Stout team and Oshkosh team both have some really big upsides. So a lot of WIAC talk today. Deal with it. I was really excited about it. They were great conversations. So other than that, Let's get into uh, some of the other things we'll be talking about today. A ton of big-time upsets in D2 football. I believe we had three or four top 15-type upsets, uh, one of them being pretty obvious and Harding being taken down, but a couple other really big-time noteworthy games. And uh, you talk about big-time upsets. We had three number one seeds upset this last week. The number one team in FBS, the number one team in FCS, and Division Two. All dethroned this last weekend. So, a lot of big-time football happening across the board. My tweet of the week, if you will, for this week comes from the D3 level, though, and from the number one team in D3 that was not taken down this past week, much in part to this man right here, Luke Lanon. He has had 50 straight games with a touchdown pass. The first player in college football history. Notice, it's not Division Three football history. Notice it's not small school history. He is the first player in college football history to throw a touchdown pass in 50 straight games. That I, that applause was lame as hell. It's just me in the studio tonight, so get over it. But Luke, and we've had him on the show. He's a great human, happens to be a great quarterback as well, as you can tell based on just that stat alone. Shout out to him. Shout out to that North Central squad. Uh, they continue to play very well. And sorry, we don't talk about them a whole lot. They just won like 70 to nothing this last week. There's not really a whole lot to say. So I'm excited to cover them down the stretch when they get into some really competitive games, but I had to highlight that because that is a really noteworthy type of statistic. But as always... You can watch the episode on YouTube if you are. Don't forget the video chapters down below. Fast forward to any part of the episode you'd like to tune into and then get the hell out of here. Or maybe, hear me out, stick around for a little bit longer. Listen to some people that maybe you haven't heard from before. Maybe hey, listen to us recap D2, D3, or NAIA stuff. So uh, that would be great. Otherwise, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, listen wherever you get your podcasts. All the video chapters will be in the description there so you can fast forward and move around. Follow us on Twitter at D1 underscore rejects at Instagram. At Division One Rejects, that's the number one inside of Division and Rejects, we hit 10K. And so that means new t-shirt dropping, probably within the week. You have my word. Eventually, it, it will get done. It's pretty sweet. I'm, I'm excited to drop this one. Hopefully, you guys, a lot of you guys will pick that one up. But don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I appreciate you all turning in, tuning in. Hello, English. Let's get to the first guest appearance of the night in Trey Tetzla. <laughs> Joining the show tonight. A crucial part of the Titans' win over Platteville. He is now the all-time receptions leader at UW Oshkosh. Trey Teslev, what's going on, man? Excited to be on here. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Talk about a long time coming. You're a guy that obviously I've followed uh, with this team, but uh, feels like this is potentially one of the best times to get you on. You're coming off a massive achievement like that. 12 catches, 152 yards to go with that. Talk about how special that is as a whole to kind of encapsulate your time down there at Oshkosh. And the season's not over yet, so we're not talking retroactively. Still a lot on the table for you guys. But uh, talk about how special that is, man, and kind of a full circle moment for you. Yeah, man, it's it's awesome. It, it's, it was a goal of mine ever since committing here. Um, so to be able to achieve it, and especially at Titan Stadium in front of friends and family and, you know, my teammates and stuff like that is it is truly special. And uh, it's, it's cool because we also won on top of it. But... Um, got to keep going now but I, there's there's so many people to thank like I end up forgetting yep. people but like the offensive line is just did a great job and some of those guys I've played with for three four years now so it's the record says my name on it but at the end of the day like 
on the quarterbacks on the line, you know, it's on the other receivers as well. And I was also fortunate enough to play with Kobe Berghammer. So like that helped oh, yeah. a little bit. So. Yeah. That dude was, uh, he was something else. And, um, yeah. I had the privilege of, of seeing him in person up at the dome. Yeah. Right. And, and you guys yeah. looked pretty damn good that day and I, and I many others. And he was a big part of that, but, uh, there are other pieces of that, you know, these, these teams over the years that have had a lot more than that. Obviously it was the, the driving factor of that offense, but, um, Let's talk about this squad a bit in general. Yeah. You guys right now, the most ranked wins out of anyone in the country. That is, is a statistic, excuse me, that feels really relevant and really mm -hmm. awesome. What has this team gone through in the first four weeks of the season? What have you learned about this squad through some of those big-time wins? Yeah, not, not going to lie. When, when we first saw the schedule release in the offseason, it's like you see all those ranked teams yeah. and – you're like, here we go. We just lost a four-year start at quarterback. And we're going to jump right into, you know, mm -hmm. playing these top dogs. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm extremely happy we played them now, obviously, that we got some wins under our belt. But we learned early on who we are as a team and, you know, what we got to improve on. And uh, it's it's not the easiest thing with an 18-year-old quarterback to be able to win those games and play against tough competition. So it's it's a learning moment for everyone. And I'm happy that we are able to pull out some wins. 100% dude you look at the schedule and there were a lot of people myself yeah. included that you look at those first two games right yeah. Wheaton Linfield and you're like yeah that you know they'd be it'd be great to come out of there with one win right to come out of there and beat one of those two teams like you talked about with right. the team that you know you return I believe it was like five all-conference selections almost 40 letter winners like you return a good amount of guys and pieces that were coming back but there were a few at key positions that you know right. there were some question marks around this team and this offense particularly so I know looking at the season beforehand yeah they'd be not lucky, but they'd be, you know, in a really good spot to come out of that with one win. You went and won both. And I think yeah. that's really fortunate for you guys to be in a place where you have these learning moments in the first couple of weeks of the season against solid competition. Most teams have those and they have to learn from a loss. You get yeah. to learn from two quality wins. And I think that is obviously a huge piece for you guys. So Wheaton week one, Linfield the week after that, how did that uh, build you guys up for some tough WIAC play? WIAC played, excuse me. Yeah. Um, it did a great job of, of building us up and getting us more team chemistry. But like for us seniors, especially, we just focus on week to week because you never know when your season's going to end, whether it be, you know, one game or, or 10 games. But um, I think that attitude really helped us with uh, obviously being weed in the first game. And then, you know, the second game, it's like, here we go. This is the most important game because it's this game. So then we win those two. And we're like, the WIAC is just as tough as some of these teams we're playing. So now let's put the, you know, the gas down and let's go. So. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. You guys are obviously rolling yeah. right now and still some, some big ones on the schedule as the WIAC continues to cannibalize itself is probably the best yeah. word. You guys right. just beat the shit out of each other all year and <laughs> make sure that maybe only one team gets into the playoffs. I mean, yeah. good God. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy it's unbelievable and, and, and prepping for the games too it's it's there's really no off week right like no. some conferences it's like oh this week we get to you know maybe lay off a little bit there's truly no off week we just saw a couple of weeks ago like stouts beating whitewater and it's yeah. like <laughs> like that's you can't take any team lightly at this point so 100 percent, man and uh, this is year three under coach jennings correct yeah. Yep. Okay. What has become more clear as he continues to lead this program? And, and what have you learned and I guess seen from the foundations that he's starting to set with this squad kind of under his leadership? Yeah, I think like one of the biggest ones for me, especially is, is the trust. Like I've had so many meetings with him and like just talking one-on-one -on -one, and he doesn't, he won't say something to me one-on-one -on -one that he's not going to say to the rest of the team. And he truly means everything he says. So at the end of the day, like when we're in a game and we need points on the board and we look over at him. It's we, he has a look in his eye of just, we trust one another, the whole team trusts them. And it's, let's just, it's time to go. And um, Oshkosh has always had a strong brotherhood here. And when he came in, he has done a great job of keeping it and not like trying to overstep anywhere or anything. And yeah. I think we build it up better than ever before. Like against lacrosse when we're down, I think it was like 30 to 14 at halftime. And we went in the locker room and he didn't say a single word. All the seniors, some seniors stuck up or stood up and started talking. We all just kind of looked each other in the eye and said, let's, let's do this thing. Our staff trusts us and we trust each other. And you no, know, we were able to pull it out that day. So. Yeah. And that's a fine line when you talk about the old with the new and, and maybe an, an yeah. example of that is, um, is it Mayo right now? The head coach of the Patriots, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and he comes in and he tears everything down. I mean, like yeah. literally, literally and figuratively tears everything down. The Patriot way is being stripped from the walls. And like, I'm not a Patriots fan, but I understand that they did a lot of really successful stuff over there yeah, in that facility, did. in that building. And, and to come in and, and take all of that down and to stamp it that this is a brand new team, a brand new culture, sometimes mm-hmm. is not the way to go. And right. I think the, the best coaches have that combination in that, they understand the expectations of any, you know, potentially great teams before them. Join with the fact that obviously a new staff is going to come in and have maybe some different kind of foundations that they want to lay for this particular team. But uh, like you kind of talked about, I think the best have a good way of of merging the two of them. But to close it out, I wanted to talk about uh, a really unique cause that uh, you have going on, and, and it's one thing to have a shirt with your name on it, my friend, but another one when exactly. some proceeds of that shirt go to a really, really sweet cause. So talk about, I'm going to just set you up. I'm going to tee it up for you. I want you to take it from there. Talk about your background and why this project has been important to you. Yeah, so I, I appreciate you for letting me letting me do that. I um have been so blessed throughout my life. So I uh, was adopted from Texas. Um, my birth mom gave birth me at the age of 15, um, obviously it wasn't the best situation. So I was put up for adoption and I was blessed enough to be put into a tremendous family and surrounded by so much support and, and things of that nature. So, um, as I grew older, I, I started to understand that more and, um, yeah. I decided I wanted to do something to give back and, you know, shine more light on adoption and, and the success it can have. So I, you know, hit up a company and decided to come out with some t-shirts. I've always had that nickname, big play tray for a while. So yep. It seemed right at the time and and whatever so we we came out with it and honestly it, it it took off but so many teammates and and friends and families bought it and reached out to me so it, it proved how much i'm blessed even like more than i originally thought honestly so um i we're over like 200 shirt sales at this that's point awesome. and, and raised a good amount of money so um it's it's going really well that's awesome man and make it 201 after this episode i gotta get in on that but um that that it really is that's a special deal and when you find ways for guys at our level to do that uh in the grand scheme of things like is it going to solve all the world's problems no but it's like this kind of moment and this kind of personal connection that and you know that fulfillment that i'm sure you get from doing this and you know trying to make that impact has it inspired some of the guys in the team and and maybe even some of the guys in the conference to try and go out and, and do things of that sort yeah, I've seen um there's been a few um like foundation type stuff people have supported and uh like my teammates have bought a bunch of shirts. So it, it's always cool when like I show up to like a team dinner or something and there's like eight dudes wearing the t-shirt <laughs> and sweet. they'll put it on right, they'll put on their Snapchat story and stuff, and then someone's gonna ask them, Oh, what's a t-shirt for? Then they ex- they can explain yep. it perfectly to whoever. So it's it's truly special, honestly. So I appreciate you asking and and letting me talk about it. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'd be remiss if I if I didn't. But uh, some big game games coming up for you guys yeah. down the stretch here. Still uh, not out of the woods quite yet. The woods being right. the freaking WIAC that we talk yeah. about. What's the right. mindset like in that locker room and the attitude moving forward? Right, like I said before, there's 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 no easy game, so we don't want to take anyone lightly because you never know who can beat who and what'll happen at the end of the year. So we're gonna focus on Stevens Point this weekend and 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 build off of them and keep going. Hopefully, finish off the year undefeated still a, a lot of football to be played down there huh yeah yes there is i'd love to see it man hopefully we can uh, continue to cover your guys and you know what maybe if the if the stars align and the, and the cards and the cookie crumbles the way it does see you guys in person at some point down the road yes, that would dude, be that really would be incredible awesome. but um Trey, i really thank you my man this has been this has been great i'm glad we finally got to have you on the show brother yeah, it's 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 thank you for letting me come on and thank you for also all the coverage you do for D2 and, and D3 sports. We really appreciate it. Thank you, my man. Have a good rest of your night. It means a lot. Big thank you to Trey for coming on the show. Now it is time to switch over. Let's go through quickly, trying to be like fast today and get through all these games. There's so many good football games to talk about, but the Division II football scene, man. This week, it was incredible. It certainly did not disappoint. Let's start with, I mean, the premier game in all of D2 this last week. Our game of the week selection. Harding goes into Wachita Baptist, and they get beat. The number one team in the country taken down by number nine, Wachita, 17-13. to 13. 
I got to watch the whole second half of this one at least. The environment was incredible. You got the Philly special or the Tiger special as they're calling it down there. A big time touchdown. Harding at the very end of the game. Obviously that flex bone offense built to sustain long drives. They go in and have to, you know, go down the entire length of the field in one minute. Had some very uncharacteristically not thought out plays you see here this is the last play from our friend Cole Keelan that one a little bit long the incompletion would seal the deal for the Bisons and uh what a statement win for this Washita team and I think a lot of people counted them out not in the way that you know they're a top 10 ranked team in the country they weren't counted out of the whole spiel but a lot of people counted them out and that they didn't think they could win this game they didn't think the Tigers could host the number one team in the country and, and take them down on their own field that's something that I don't think people were really expecting and the plays from the offense were great for this Watchtaw team. The defense from this Tiger squad were playing out of their mind. You had some great individual performances defensively. Guys like, uh, you look here, Dawson Miller, 16 tackles in the day and a fumble recovery. How about uh, uh, Jarelin Burks, 12 tackles, a TFL. You look down the list, there's a lot of other great individual performances. But as a team, as a group, I think what really stood out to me, that front seven for Watchtaw, their ability to maintain kind of a, a really just hold Harding. Like you you held Harding down and did not let them eat up that clock and hold the time possession, generated a couple, you know, those big time stops, those turnovers. And I, what that boils down to for me, you have two teams that are incredibly familiar with each other. And that's different than Harding going and playing Pittsburgh State or GVSU in the playoffs, right? Or Central Missouri. These are two teams that go at it every single year. This is a Wachita defensive staff and defensive group that knows exactly what to expect from this Harding squad. It's probably been game planning for that multiple years. This is a, a game and a kind of a budding rivalry, although Wachita and Henderson obviously have the kind of the battle down there. But um, this is a game and budding rivalry where these teams know exactly what to expect from each other. And I think that was the, the key point for this Watchtaw team. They knew exactly what they were getting into, and defensively, they stepped up to the task. It was an incredible performance uh, from a team that certainly deserved that big-time win, and uh, I do have to shout out the guys in the broadcast, too. It was one of the best, uh, most fun games to listen to. That environment, second to none down there in Arkadelphia. Almost 6,000 watching the game live on YouTube with me. That is crazy. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, yeah, another cliff note for Harding. You look at their offense. Certainly not built for the late game heroics. Harding does not have a two minute drill kind of built into that that scheme down there. They made some boneheaded mistakes in that final drive, which is uncharacteristic of them. And you know, I'm not saying change your game plan and just you know, abandon the flex bone after one loss after 26 in your 26th game. You win the last 25. But what I am saying is, you know, if you're Harding, there's going to be some other really good teams down the line. You're going to be playing in the postseason if you're Harding for sure. And there's probably going to be another moment that. Harding needs to have some late-game heroics where there's, you know, less than two minutes on the clock. So now this might be a really great learning experience for this Bisons team up there in Searcy that they can go and game plan and have some things prepared for that moment that you're not scrapping and totally twitching up the offense or, you know, throwing away all this foundation you have, but adding a wrinkle or two, you know, to a fact where you could actually make something happen in these points because their offense just certainly did not get it done. They're running, running a one-man route with – you know, 40 seconds left in the game. And Braden Jay, who is obviously a great playmaker, you could put anyone out there. They're not going into quadruple coverage and pulling down a ball. So it could be a great learning moment for this Harding team. But let's move forward. Another top 25 matchup. Number 13, Charleston. They go into number 22, Frostburg State, and absolutely have their way with them. Uh, Siobhan Wright, he now leads the country across all levels in total rushing yards. 1,296. That's uh, just under 200 a game. For you mathematicians. Charleston 7-0 for the first time since 2009. That feels pretty awesome. Charleston in this one, they got out. I mean, this game was 48 to nothing at one point. Frostburg didn't even score until 2 minutes and 20 seconds left in the fourth quarter. This was a dominant performance. Wright scores 5 touchdowns in this one. He scored the first 3 uh, in the first half. And this team was absolutely rolling. This Charleston squad... There is a lot of really good things going for them right now to highlight some other individual performances. Neither team did too much through the air. It was obviously a ground and pound type of game for the Charleston squad. Uh, Maquan Heron, though, four catches, 78 yards. Feels like a pretty good stat line for him. And then defensively for Charleston, you had 
Uh, two fumble recoveries on the day that were pretty big time moments. You had an interception through the air, uh, to Davis Preston, a couple of guys showing up big time, like Nesta Owens with two sacks. Kashawn Beasley got into the backfield, and those guys forced a fumble as well. And uh, really, an all three phases type of win for this Charleston squad. And people are taking them very seriously now. I don't know if they were at the start of the season. They are, I tell you what, they're taking them very seriously now, and they've got a really good chance to shake things up over in that super region. But speaking of a shakeup, this might be the best example of that. We've talked a lot about this Slippery Rock team. And you know what? I think Chuck Bittner, watching D2Football.com, inside D2, D2 Football, excuse me, this week, he made some really good points about how this Slippery Rock team is winning games, albeit winning them a little bit differently. They haven't been doing it, um, one, the same level of kind of dominance when it comes offensively, but they also have been doing it in kind of different ways in that they're controlling the time of possession and, and kind of grinding out these kind of games is not winning these games on explosive plays. Well, Eventually, when you switch things up like that, it might come back to bite you. This week, it did. California, PA, they pick up a massive win on their homecoming over what was then the number six team in the country in Slippery Rock. You see it here. It starts off early. They air this thing out all the way down the field. That was uh, a statement start to this one. That was uh, Eric Willis from uh, Davis Black, 65 yards. That was 10 seconds on the time possession to open things up and get this thing going. That would turn into 14 nothing here. Eric McCann, 14 yards into the end zone. The Vulcans had things going. Even more here, another field goal would make it 17 nothing. I mean, we're still in the first half. Slippery Rock does go ahead and answer with a uh, touchdown pass. Kylan Wilson catches one from Braden Long, but... Uh, Two more scores in the second half from Cal, and this thing kind of got out of hand. 28-7, to the final here. The Vulcans looked, I mean, really, really solid in this one at uh, in Adamson Stadium. But you look through here, Brayden Long's still going to go get his. 24 for 38, 282, and a touchdown. Did have one interception through the air. Cal, though, Davis Black put on quite the performance. 16 for 26, 250, and a tud through the air. Certainly helps. The Rock rushing attack was almost completely nullified in this one. Idris Lawrence, five carries for 33 yards. That's an All-American type caliber back coming over from Notre Dame College. He was pretty much snuffed on the day. Uh, Chris Dior, Braden Long also had a couple rushes that did not go anywhere. So that Cal rushing defense really got things done. Eric Willis, we saw his big-time touchdown. Five catches, 106 yards for him and a touchdown through the air. So a big-time win for this Cal squad. And I'll have to look and see here. We look at their schedule. For California, they're 6-1 and one right now. Their one loss, a four-point loss, that Charleston team we just talked about. You already pick up some statement wins over teams like Westchester and Lock Haven on the road. You win at Seton Hill last week. Their margin of victory in most of these games is less than one score, but they are winning these games against quality opponents, and they just had their best performance yet against the best competition they'll play all year. Now... Going into this weekend on the 26th here, the 15th Cole Bowl against IUP that is at home. They actually finished their last three games at home. So now you're looking at a Cal team that they take care of business this weekend. This could be a, a one-loss Cal team going into the playoffs that is really going to shake some things up. So excited to see what they will continue to do moving on into the rest of the year. Let's talk about maybe a little bit of another surprise. This time, though, over in the GMAC. Kentucky Wesleyan picks up what I feel like is a really statement win for that program. They travel up to Midland, Michigan to take on the Timberwolves from Northwood and come out of it with a win, 27-20. to And uh, this one, we'll go through the highlights. The, the big play at the end here, Brandon Mackey scores the game-winning touchdown with five seconds left for the Panthers. But, uh, you know, Kentucky Wesleyan was 1-4. Heading into Saturday, Northwood four and two, seemingly making the turn under Coach Buer there, and uh, had a big win over Saginaw earlier in the year. Still some growing pains, evidently, for this Timberwolf squad. Not to say the season is a failure because they're still doing a lot of really good things, but a tough loss for this Northwood squad. In the first half, things were tied up at thirteen apiece. Heading into halftime, Northwood and uh, Kentucky Wesley would both score in the third quarter, and the fourth quarter was almost entirely scoreless until the very end when uh, Mackey puts one in to finish the deal for Kentucky Wesleyan. And you talk about a statement win for Coach Young and company down there at Kentucky Wesleyan. That's a really big-time win for those guys and one that uh, when you're 1-4, 
you start to lose guys maybe having the buy-in, right? Guys start to check out, and it happens at all levels of football. Whether you believe it or not, when you're not winning, you're not succeeding, and you're really struggling, you're going to have some guys that check out. This is a win that could revitalize your season, especially in conference play. Maybe they go on here. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs or go and win a, a regional championship, but what I'm saying is they could go now and win a couple more conference games that they're not supposed to win on paper. So that feels like a really big-time win for that Kentucky Wesleyan squad. But... Let's move over to uh, some Lone Star competition. We haven't talked too much about this conference, I feel like, as of late. A UTPB squad that maybe has disappointed compared to some of the preseason expectations. They take on Western Oregon this week. And uh, this one, incredibly back and forth. Back and forth in the way that UTPB scores the first two touchdowns of this one. They went up 14-0 in the first quarter. You'll see the first score, I do believe, here. There it is. That's Deion Cook from Isaac Mooring. And uh, UTP up, TB, excuse me, up 7 nothing, And they got things rolling, but going into halftime, it was actually a pretty evened-up game. Western Oregon took the lead 20-14 to going into the half. And I'll let you go through some of the some of the clips here, but the uh, the play at the end of the game is what really seals it, and we'll I'll just kind of talk as we go along. That's a touchdown there from Western Oregon. Uh, Kevon Eady from uh, Canada Jones. Field goal there to kind of get things going. This UTPB squad, the offense is starting to find their rhythm, certainly. Kenny Hernser, uh, losing him is obviously a big deal under center. But uh, the overtime kick is what really sealed the deal, and I guess they don't have it on, on this clip. I apologize. But the overtime clip is what really sealed the deal. I have to find... I have to find that clip because it's it'd be too good not to uh, not to show it on here. I'm gonna pull it up real quick. So now in overtime, Keaton Emmett to seal the deal through the uprights. That one's good from 29 yards out. Western Oregon takes this one. A statement win for the Wolves. You see the celebration there at midfield. I mean, what a time to be a fan of this WOU squad. That is, uh, that's a pretty exciting win for that team. And, you know, we haven't talked about them too much on the show, but really excited for them to have that kind of success. And you look at them this year and the schedule as far as 2024, what that holds for them. They're 5-2 and two right now. This Western Oregon squad is 5-2 and two with statement wins now over UTPB, and you've got West Texas A&M a win there. Um, right now, you're undefeated inside of the Lone Star Conference. This is the team that could run the table and win out in the league. Your two losses are at Idaho State and Cal Poly, out-of-division type games. This team is a really, really well-equipped team to go on and make some noise in the postseason, and admittedly one that I did not expect whatsoever. So, really impressive win for those guys. But let's move over to the Gulf South here and talk about uh, another little upset, if you will. Number 10, West Alabama goes into Delta State, and they get beat. 21-6, to the Statesmen take this one. You see them driving here in the first stop, just short of the goal line right there. And uh, this is a big-time win for a Delta State squad that has been a little bit back and forth. The first touchdown coming on the ground right here off the legs of Cole Kirk for the Statesman. There he is, celebrating with his squad. Then uh, West Alabama, they respond respond. Excuse me, right here up the middle. That's Bry Webb with a score for the Tigers there. And this one was all scores in the first half. The second half, the defense has both pitched shutouts, which is worth noting. Now, the extra point there gets blocked and stuffed, which uh, would kind of be inconsequential at the end of the day. But you look at the performances in this one. Cole Kirk certainly had a day through the air. Spencer Arsenal, I'm assuming hopefully pronouncing that one correct, the quarterback for UWA, 61 pass attempts on the day for him. That is ridiculous. Um, also ridiculous, that big-time touchdown for Delta State right there. But a really big-time win for the Statesman squad as they move forward into Gulf South play. 5-2 and two right now, had a loss to Wingate earlier on out of conference, and then they had that tough loss to West Florida, but still a lot of uh, big-time football to be played here. You look at their last three weeks of the year. North Greenville, who's playing some good ball right now, Valdosta State, enough said, and then Mississippi College, some tough games to close out the year if you're DSU, but uh, certainly feels like a team that is well-equipped to do that. Very 
closely coming off of losing Patrick Shegog and some other pieces of that statesman offense. Still going to be a lot going on there. Let's close things off with some GLIAC action. The new number one team in the country, that's Grand Valley State University. The Battle of the Valleys this last week for Saginaw Valley State. Grand Valley comes out on top. Let's roll the tape. Let's talk about it a little bit as we, uh, as we get into this. And SVSU, as you'll see here, I don't know if this is the, the highlights are from GVSU, but we'll see if they end up showing it or not. I have to check it out. No, they, they didn't. But um, GVSU on their first offensive snap, a safety from Saginaw Valley would start things off two to nothing. And I think that was kind of the best indicator of where this game was going. You got a couple of big chunk plays from this GVSU offense, um, but really the, the name of the game were both defenses playing at an incredible clip. And when you look through this, you know, there's not many turnovers generated. I don't think actually there were any, doesn't look like any fumbles or interceptions or those kind of things, but just some really good defensive performances from both sides. Anthony Cardamone, a big one, 11 tackles, a sack, two TFLs, and a PBU on the day for Grand Valley. But Saginaw Valley, we know that defense has been playing at an incredible clip, led by the likes of guys like Brandon Rawls, Alfred Daly Jr., Micah Kretzinger in that linebacker core, Elijah Gordon. All of these guys' big time plays had one, two, three, four, five, six different guys in the books for sacks on the day for Saginaw Valley and a lot of them registering other points in the stat book but uh, at the end of the day it wasn't enough GVSU comes out on top of this one uh, with a final score of 16 to 9 that might be a weird score Agami it feels like um, into the halftime though Saginaw up 9 to 3 GVSU would score twice in the second half to finish this one off and now you're looking at the number one team in the country right now with the loss to Harding and a team that going into the Anchor Bone weekend, has a lot at stake. Ferris State, Grand Valley State in Allendale this week. That game is going to be absolutely ridiculous. I would love to be there, but uh, it's going to be a really fun one down there in Allendale for uh, for both parties. I mean, obviously, one of them will have to you know, eventually actually win the game, but that could have a lot of playoff and GLIAC implications inside of that. But, whew, close things off here. Some quick hitters for you. Carson Newman, they improved to 7-0 after a win over UVA Wise. How about them Eagles? Roosevelt, they get their first D2 win and first GLIAC win over NMU in OT. Beat the Cats down up here in the Superior Dome. Davenport, they come from behind. Some more GLIAC action to beat Wayne State, 43-26. Then you had number 8, Central Oklahoma, avoiding an upset against Northeastern State. That game was crazy. Northeastern State, the Riverhawks were up big, and UCO comes from behind, and their offense exploded in that second half to bring them back and win that one. UCM, they bounced back. Three losses for a UCM team was not on my bingo card for this year, especially with Zabrowski back under center. But uh, they take down Northwest Missouri State 35-30, a pretty big statement win for the Mules. Probably one of the biggest ones, though, in the MIAA, Pitt State. They come up with some big plays late to overcome Fort Hayes State, a one-point win for uh, what they like to call Lit State over there, which I think is actually uh, totally hilarious. Number seven, Pitt State hosting Fort Hayes State. I got a couple of clips uh, from this one for you guys, too. And, uh, you know, this Fort Hayes, Fort Hayes State team, excuse me, has no slouch, no pushover. But it was the defense for Pitt State that stepped up late. They had a pass deflected and an interception that would lead to the game-scoring touchdown in the fourth quarter. And looking forward for this Pitt State squad, you're playing UCO this weekend. Those are two top five, top ten caliber teams squaring off for what will most likely be the MIAA championship, but will also be a, a bid in Super Region number three. So really excited to see how that one pans out down there. This Pitt State squad has been really uh, fun to follow through this year, and this UCO team with Jet Huff and uh, Terrell Davis and those kind of guys has been really exciting as well. How about that play in the back of the end zone right there? Holy shit. Uh, but a lot of MIAA action that has been really exciting. Outside of the MIAA, Benedict outlasts Allen in overtime 34-27, and then Wheeling with a big-time win, 35-33 over West Virginia State. Whew! A lot of ball to be talked. Let's move over to that guest conversation with Richie and Jimmy, and then we'll close things off with a little bit of NAIA talk. <laughs> Joining the show tonight, a big-time contributor to their upset win last week over Whitewater. We'll talk about it a little bit this week as well, but uh, this man, one of the best content creators in the college football landscape, Richie Murphy. What's going on, man? What's up, Colby? <laughs> Standing O from Jim to start the show. We're hey, sitting oh yeah first of all thanks for having me on both of you guys you know you guys have been killing it super cool to kind of see it grow a little bit 
obviously Jimmy, one of my teammates, a good friend. I've been following you for a little bit and the show is sick and I'm excited to see where it, where it's going to go. I appreciate it's, that, man. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. No, this has uh, definitely been a long time coming to finally just get you on here, dude. I know we've talked about it. Um, followed you for a long time as well, so I'll put that right back at you because of the stuff that you've been making, whether it's you know Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Um, I've been loving the YouTube content. YouTube stuff is really sweet, and, and we talk about shining a light on, on the small school players. You have it from such a cool perspective, and I think it's a lot of the same things that we talk about. Why don't we treat the D2, the D3, the NAIA guys like the D1s? So you going out and uh, emailing 100 businesses and, and trying to find NIL, NIL deals, excuse me, or showing off the game day experience for D3 student athletes, like this is promo, this is sweet material for dudes coming out of high school that probably eat this up, and I imagine a lot of them see your videos and it opens their eyes to like, this is a D3 player, and he has all these really cool, unique experiences. Like, that's that's so awesome. What's the feed, uh, feedback been like on your channels? Um, You know, obviously, you kind of pay attention to the negative stuff a lot. But yeah, it's tough. Ma the majority of it is, oh, I didn't know it was this serious at the D3 level. Or, oh, I'm looking to play D3, and I'm, you know, I think I'm a good ambassador, I guess, for D3 because – I try it. I mean, I love, I love college football. I love playing D three football, any level, whatever it is. I think it's an awesome thing, and every kid, if you have the opportunity to, should try and play. Um, so, I mean, the feedback has been awesome. You know, sometimes there's a little bit of crap I get, but that just kind of comes with the job. Oh um, yeah, it does. Yeah. If you ain't hate what it's if you ain't got haters. <laughs> I don't know. Something you ain't you ain't doing. Yeah, you ain't popping. There you go, man. And uh, hell of a week for uh, D1R to take a bye, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like, we Just don't do that. Like, we don't like yeah. we don't take like, weeks off. And, and last yeah. week I'm texting him and I'm like, dude, I, I was just telling him before we got going, like, I worked like seven or eight hours on Saturday and then another full day on Sunday. And the last thing I was about to do was, was come out and record the pod, which was tough. But uh, you guys, let's talk about you guys. That Whitewater game first. You, Rich, you got two takeaways in that one for the Blue Devils. You beat the Warhawks for the first time since 2001. That feels like a very monumental, program-defining type of win. Talk me through that one and your contribution, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, the two picks – Pretty much all the credit D line linebackers kind of boxed the quarterback. And, oh, yeah. You know, we were up pretty much the whole game. I think they went up three to zero and then we were up the rest of the game. Um, so they were kind of coming from behind and, you know, they had to throw and our D line got to the quarterback. It felt like every single play he was scrambling and making a throw on the run. So there were balls that were, you know, interceptable and, you know, just all kind of all the credit goes to the D line there and linebackers keep it contained. You know, making the quarterback get out of the pocket. Um, oh yeah, you've been coaching I mean, this guy up, Jimmy, or what? These are good answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> I mean, just the win as a whole, like, you know, it means a lot, right? But it's super hard to have that kind of win, like right away in conference because you know the season's long and. It feels like a big accomplishment, but at the end of the day, it's just, you know, one conference win. And that's probably not what you, you know, you're not, you're not searching for one sole win all year, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if I want to talk about this week. Should I? Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that in a second. Right. Uh, yeah, don't but you, I mean, don't you worry yeah, about I know, that. I know you want to, Richie. Let's, I know it's uh, a big one. Let's stay let's stay on on the Whitewater for just another beat because of, you know, obviously that being a big game for you guys. And of course, we missed that week. But the first possession of this one offensively, you guys fumble and Whitewater's got pretty good field position, right? The defense steps up in those moments. You guys only concede a field goal. I have to imagine that kind of set the tone for the rest of this game because that could have been the start of a snowball effect. You fumble, they drive down and score their first trip in the red zone, give them a short field offensively, but that didn't happen. You hold them to a field goal. How did that set the tone for the game? Yeah, I mean, it just they're going to have to earn everything. Um, and I feel like that's kind of Stout's, you know, mantra or – 
like lore about them. Like you're, it's not going to be an easy game. You're going to have to earn everything. We do good with the run and, you know, we try and take away the run. So they have to pass. Um, and I feel like we did that versus, you know, whitewater. Hell yeah, you did, man. Jimmy, talk about the reaction from that one, dude, from those guys that had to have been an awesome environment. Yeah. I mean, so <clears throat> I'll take you through like the last couple plays. So we, we punted and it was kind of like a pooch punt. They got the ball like the 20 and they were left with like, I don't know if they had even had a timeout left. And the last play of the game, Sanidi was rolling out and he ran forward and he threw the, he was trying to do like a sideways lateral, but he threw it like accidentally forward. And we caught, we all kind of knew that because there was under 10 seconds that there was going to be a runoff. So we were kind of all like staying back, staying back. And once they like made the call, everyone just like rushed the field and like, my Twitter uh, header now is like all of us running onto the field. And no, it was a that's great awesome. Time. I think Noah Albrecht got that one. So shout out to Noah for the shot on that. He's, he does great with the camera on uh, game day. But uh, yeah, man, it's just a surreal moment. You know, I I didn't even play in the game. And it's one of those things where it didn't even feel like real. Because we talked about all week, like how we can do it. We know we can. And it's just a great team effort. And uh, man, I was just so proud of our team. Yes, it was fantastic. Totally. And what really, uh, you know, we'll talk about a little bit here, the uh, explosive plays. And that's something that I feel like, you know, hurt you guys in a way. A 73-yard touchdown pass, a 95-yard kick return. Is it hard to bounce back from something like that when you guys go on a 12, 13, 14 play drive and grind out five, six minutes of clock and they respond instantly? How are you guys able to uh, respond in that way? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's just hard. You, you kind of have to tune everything out except the next play. Like as a DB, if you play DB, you know, you know, you're going to get beat. The other, the guy across from you is an athlete. He's going to make a play, True. but can you line up again and stop him again? And then it's just like one play at a time, win every rep and do what you can that play. If you win it or lost it, go on to the next and try and win that one. So you know, that kickoff, definitely a huge moment. And pretty much their offense was explosives and that kickoff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's usually a good thing for an offense, but that, that was kind of all they had, really. Um, so if you take away those couple plays, you know, the game looks even worse, you know, uh, as far as, like, stat sheet goes. But, yeah, it's yeah. just next play mentality. and. No, I hear you. Yeah. It's crazy how just a few game, uh, plays, excuse me, can can change the way of that game. And you guys kind of on the flip side of that the next week, right? Let's talk about River Falls a little bit this weekend. 27-6, you guys rolling offensively, holding one of the best offenses in the country to very little. And again, the snap, just like that, turns around. What would you learn about that offense from the Falcons? Obviously, you guys have a lot of respect for them going into that game. You know exactly kind of the competition you're up against. But what did you learn about that offense, that game, and kind of the challenges they posed for you? Yeah, um, I'm a big believer, like, you know, halftime is super hard. You know, you just want to keep playing, whether you're up or down. But I'm a big believer in, like, all right, don't even worry about what happened before. It, but I just said it, next play. That's kind of our thing. As far as DBs goes, that's our thing. Next play, next play. Mm -hmm. Interception, all right, next play. You know, touchdown, all right, whatever, next play. But we knew, you know, their fast-paced offense could put up points quick. And, you know, we we were we were, you know, verbally making that known in halftime. Um, and, you know, they came out with adjustments and kind of beat us on, you know, the same <laughs> thing, kind of worst case scenario for both sides of the ball for us. Um, definitely a definitely a heartbreaking loss. Um, but, you know, the good thing is we're kind of. You know, we're the underdogs. People overlook Stout, and I kind of like that. I, I, I tokened, you know, the underdog mentality. I love it. Um, and we get the opportunity to play like three ranked opponents, you know, in the next four weeks. And yeah. not every not every team gets that. Um, so I still think, you know, we control our own destiny, and we can take you know, this season as far as we want to, um, as far as within our team. 
Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say off of that too. And you really just summed it up really well in that not many teams where well, you guys look at yourself now four and two, two losses obviously going to get you on the outside looking in when it comes to the playoffs. But when you have the schedule ahead of you that you guys have that is unique to your squad, everything, like you said, is still in front of you. And I think coming off of a big time emotional win for you guys to put up that kind of fight against a quality River Falls squad was impressive. Now, you don't come away with that win. Are there any moral victories from a game and a performance like that and as a confidence boost for your guys so you can compete with everyone in the league, or is that something that had already been known? Um, I think we all knew it. I don't really – I mean, there's not a lot of positives out of losing that, I guess. Yeah. You know, I mean, that this is just my mentality, just – move on, you know, whitewater week, we win, move on river week. We lost. All right. Eau Claire, you know, yep. um, but yeah, I mean, it's crazy that, you know, the Wyack is, it's crazy right now. It is um, dude. Y'all are beating each other up every single one, week. The one positive I can think of is, you know, let people overlook us more because the guys in our locker room and the coaching staff, we know what we have. So, let let every let everyone overlook us, um, and we're gonna come. You know, we're gonna come to play every Saturday. Hell yeah! Cut a nice little promo. You got anything for Richie Jim? While we got him? Yeah, uh, just a quick one. So after your second interception, you were like blowing kisses up to the press box in the corner. <laughs> was there anyone you were like specifically pointing at? Like I was always, I was curious. Um. So. You know, Stout's old ex O coordinator. You know, I was here. He, he was here when I was a freshman. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like that DB O coordinator rivalry. Um, and he obviously went to Whitewater. You know, following the freshman season. But um, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of the sport. It's competitive, and you know, finally getting over that hump of beating them, especially when it was, you know, that kind of close to home because he was a stout guy. He was a stout coach. Um, getting that win felt really good. Um, and yeah, <laughs> but I think, you know, Nick Peshek, offensive coordinator, good, great coordinator. He did a lot of great things at stout, like stouts offense, you know, was and is, you know, a really good, um, coached offense, I think. Oh Yeah. Oh yeah, love to see it, dude. That's what's that's what's neat about a lot of these leagues. Um, we see it at the D two level all the time, where we have guys in these uh, quote unquote homecoming type of deals, where uh, they'll move around in conference, and it ends up with some really interesting matchups. So it uh, it kind of ups the ante for for a lot of these games too, because you have that level of familiarity with a lot of your opponents, and in this case, you know even some members of the coaching staff. So I think that's what makes uh, you know football, college football in general, super unique, and you kind of get it at all levels. But Richie, I think that's all I got for you tonight, brother. I really appreciate your time man yes sir thanks both of you for having me on i'll be continuing to watch and seeing you guys grow hell yeah thank you my man have a good rest thank of your night you. always happy to have you see you boys let's move over some d3 football we'll start things off had trey earlier on the show but uh we gotta talk about this oshkosh uh game jimmy oshkosh platteville number 19 at number six Talk to me about this one, dude. The Titans in a very similar spot as the Blue Devils in that they control their destiny. If they win out, they've got a lot of football to be played, but obviously you've got a meeting between those two schools. They've got River Falls the last week. There's still some big games to be had, but talk about this win over Platteville for the Titans. Yeah, so Oshkosh just continues to uh, notch in uh, victories against ranked opponents, being their fourth win of the year against the top 25 team. Um, another playoff resume builder against a team who many believe was the favorite in the WIAC, but as we know, the WIAC has been an absolute gauntlet this year, and there is no one really knows who the favorite is, quite honestly. And yeah. uh, I mean, man, oh man, just a heck of a win against a great program in Gladville. Uh, uh, scoring 24 points again against them is a huge accomplishment, and obviously, hold them to 17 get the victory is big as well. Uh, I mean, man, oh man, I what what you'll laugh, but when I think of Oshkosh being these ranked teams, it's like you know that meme. It's like the Grim Reaper, and he's like knocking on the door. Yes. And it's like, like a picture. Who's that, that's what Oshkosh is doing to these ranked teams all year long, and look for them to continue to do that. And it's funny because the first episode of the season, I picked Oshkosh to lose, and 
they took that personally, man. They just keep winning football games. <laughs> I tell you what, I don't know if they're too worried about what I was saying, but I feel like the nation as a whole kind of had a similar opinion as me. Uh, coming into that Wheaton game, and they just came out firing. They haven't looked back. So props to Oshkosh. No, 100%. And this one starts off uh, kind of rather slowly. You see the field goal here that ties things up at three in the first, but Platteville would strike first when it comes to touchdowns and uh, they went to the half, leading 10-3. And this is a Platteville defense that I know we've talked about a lot. You see a big takeaway right there for the Titans. But a Platteville defense we've talked about a lot. And even though they do lose some big-time pieces, uh, Justin Blazy last year being obviously the biggest one right there. Uh, by the way, how about that? You get the turnover, and then you cough it up on just the uh, the ensuing couple plays there, which is ridiculous. That kind of describes this game, I think, in a, in a nutshell. And that would be the first score for Platteville off of the turnover. But... Um, for me, we've talked so much about this defense for Platteville, and what we've seen is that the offense has exceeded a lot of expectations. And now having a, a great defense does help with that, kind of like an interception right there through the air. Oshkosh struggling early with some of those red zone chances of turning the ball over and kind of those drives just not being able to finish in that area. But uh, again, give credit to Platteville. Like you said, this is not the first time they've done it. Probably won't be the last. The Wyatt continues to cannibalize each other. Are we only going to get one Wyatt team in the playoff? I don't know about that, but it's definitely uh, <laughs> we're definitely eating each other alive. DC or whatever, if you will, and uh, I, I believe that's true. I mean, there's just top to bottom. There's team even you know, players in like really competitive this year. Stevens points been a lot better. Um, you know, obviously Stout, the Blue Devils have been uh, surprising a lot of people as well. So the Wax is uh, anyone's game right now. It does feel like there's a lot more parity in the league this year maybe than some had expected. Lacrosse seemed like the pretty heavy favorite with Whitewater behind them. And obviously River Falls did get a lot of love in the preseason. How about this touchdown, by the way? I thought this was in two times speed the first time I watched that. <laughs> that was outrageous, just up and down the sideline right there. But um, we've had a couple of teams, obviously you guys over there and Stout being one of them, Platteville being another. And I mean, Oshkosh, throw them right in that mix, that – yeah, we knew we were going to be quality opponents, but we didn't think they would be competing for a WAC title. Like These are just not things maybe that we thought about in the preseason. Now, obviously, you guys in that locker room over there had all the confidence in that squad. I'm talking on the outside looking in. Uh, this is a league that has seen so much more parity than uh, maybe we expected, and there's the man himself, Tetzlaff, bringing that one in as he breaks the they record. Play but that's, like that's uh, what they call him, right? We can, we can move forward a little bit. Let's talk about... Your Blue Devils, my friend. Number 11, River Falls. They come into town to take on Stout. This one goes all the way. Does, can't get decided in regulation. Goes into overtime. A really tough finish. 40-37, to 37, River Falls takes this one over the Blue, Blue Devils. Yeah, it's a tough one, man. In my notes here, I just have, like, sad face emoji. <laughs> next to it, man, like, these the, – the guys battled so hard, man. You know, it, it just – it's a testament to the coaching staff, too. Like, you know, we started 0-1, and, and we could have just thrown in the towel, and it did not go that way. We ripped off four in a row, including a couple of huge wins, one being obviously against Whitewater. And then you have River Falls in the ropes, um, obviously without Baja. But, um, you know, River yeah. Falls is a great team, and we went in there and competed, man. We had them on the ropes. We just couldn't finish. Um, credit them for fighting and battling, man, all the way. But, uh, yeah, they got uh, lacrosse next week. This week, I should say, and then we have Eau Claire for homecoming. Yep. So, uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the next one, like Richie said, you know, we're always thinking – What's next? It's never like we're never focusing on the past. It's always what can we do right now? Yeah, and that was, I think, obviously the, the biggest takeaway from this game is, uh, you know, the change under center for that River Falls attack. And you saw a pretty much almost even split between uh, Riley Warzynski and Kate Fitzgerald had 24 and 23 attempts, respectively. What did you see from those two under center? Obviously, being able to watch that game up close and personal, my man, being right yeah. there. Uh, what did yeah. you see from that group under center? And, and what does that mean for this Falcon squad? Uh, I would say River Falls does not have a shortage at quarterback. Uh, as some, <laughs> everyone, was, everyone was talking about, oh, no, Baja, no, Baja. Man, oh, man. River Falls has a great quarterback room. Their old kids are all athletes. Um, obviously, you saw Fitzgerald have a heck of a game. Uh, no, it started off a little slow. You know, you had to adjust, you know, get used to the system a little bit, and then they were rolling for a while. They, they did score on defense. Uh, we had a pretty critical turnover uh, in the game. But, you know, like we say, next play. You know, you know, we kept fighting, had a field goal at the end of regulation, a really long one, couldn't get it in through the yep. uprights. But uh, Coolio has been an absolute stud for us all year. He actually is cool. the school record, he's the school record holder for kicking. Now, so. Yeah, and you see on the pretty, film pretty here as we, as we roll it, 
River Falls turns that one over in the red zone. That was a really key moment of this game. I mean, 13 to 6, they're driving down to score. They cough it up. You guys go the other way, flip the field position, and then defense comes up with a big time stop there on third and 14. And this one, and we kind of mentioned it talking with Richie, which will go later on in the episode, but 27 to 6 at one point. Stout absolutely rolling, and this offense without Blaha for River Falls able to bounce back feels like a really important factor, I guess, uh, intangible mm-hmm. for this team. There's the touchdown that made the largest lead of the game for you guys. I mean, what was the confidence level like on the road up about four scores? I think three, I mean, three scores. I mean, we were preparing to win the game. I mean, I don't think anyone was like surprised we were winning yep. on our side. It's just, uh, a lot of people outside are probably like, whoa, what the hell's going on? And then obviously you saw Blue Falls come back, obviously. Um, man, we're we're not going anywhere, man. We'll, we'll be here. So <laughs> I'm with you. Talk about the uh, yeah. the series in, in overtime. I'm going to try and, and fast forward and bring it up to that. But you guys get them to, I believe it was a third and four in overtime and uh, are not able to stop them, which you had the field goal, right? You got the ball first, had a field goal in overtime, so they mm-hmm. need a touchdown to win or a field goal to keep things going. And uh, third and four, you guys unable to stop them. Quarterback runs it in from, I believe, like the two-yard line. Yeah, here it is right there, the game-winning yeah. score. Talk me through that that series. And, I mean, that that play right there, that third-down conversion probably sealed the deal. Yeah, you know, it's just – one of those things where when you're just watching, you know, you can't really do a whole lot. Uh, but, you know, just kind of gut-wrenching. It's the only way I can really describe it as, uh, you know, we we talked in the quarterback meeting today. It's like, hey, that sucked. But, yeah. like, we'll let it go. Because, you know, we have yep. a huge game this week. The players have been having a pretty solid year. They're a lot better than they have been. And we have to uh, prepare like they're anybody else. You know, they're probably our biggest rival. I mean, them at River Falls, obviously, being that they're both right down the road. But, uh, yeah, we just got to come out and, Fire away this week. I hear you there, my friend. Let's move over and talk about uh, a pretty big time upset. That being in the pack, the PAC, Washington and Jefferson pick up a win against number seven, Grove City, 27 19. And this definitely shakes up the conference, but uh, also shakes up some playoff kind of implications when you look at um, the obvious answer of the automatic bid. But this is not a game I think that a lot of people expected to go this way. No, yeah. And this was going to be like a really good game because. Uh, on the Hanson ratings, it was like the top like rated games. So, you know, like, every week you go on the Hanson ratings, it's like the first one. There's like a game rating, if you will. This was the top game of the week. Okay. Uh, so you know, a lot of people obviously picking Grove City to win. They're undefeated, but Washington Jefferson was not to be slept on by any means. Like they were five and one heading into this one, and handed Grove City their first loss of the season. Um, they still the deal with a touchdown just about a minute to go to extend the lead from one to eight. So obviously, you want to score a touchdown there. Don't don't want to let them get a field goal and tie it, but uh, or take the lead. Maybe if you don't even score, yep. but uh, Grove City falling just short of the comeback. Uh, they have uh, Teal next week, and they should win that one. You know, obviously, if Grove City wins out, they'll still most likely get in with this expanded playoff. You know, if both of these teams end up winning out, they'll both get in. And Jefferson, Washington, Jefferson will get the automatic bid if they win out, being that they'll be leading the conference. But uh, yeah. Grove City, like we said about Stout earlier, Grove City is not going anywhere. They made a pretty solid playoff run last year, and. They're looking to do that again. So Yeah, and you're trying to prove right now, if you're the Wolverines over there, that, that was not a one-time deal. This was not a fluke. They're not the Carly Rae Jemsen of the D3 football <laughs> scene, if you will. Um, but, but I got to give the deep, pack more that's credit. That's a deep pull. Carly Rae Jemsen. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty number. good. So calm, you maybe. Wow. Um, I, just, I totally forgot she existed, though. That's a, <laughs> I feel like see, I'm in eighth grade again. Right she now. was a one-time deal. Yeah, uh, one-trick pony. <laughs> yes. That's what Grove City is trying to prove they are not. And uh, I got to give more credit to the pack right now, Jimmy, the President's Athletic Conference. And uh, we've known that the top third of this conference has been playing some really good football, and that's something that I've, I've been aware of. But uh, the depth of this conference this year is some of the best. And the WAC is obviously still the front runner, but I would put this right up there probably in that second slot. You look right now, neither of those teams, even though that was kind of a game of the week caliber type of game, neither of those teams are leading the conference right now. Case Western Reserve, 6-0 and right now. Then you go Washington and Jefferson at 6-1. and Carnegie That's Mellon at 5-1. and Grove City, 5-1. and Westminster, 5-1. and Like, there's a really good chunk. This top half of the conference now is playing really good ball. And the drop-off now, your bottom four to five teams still really struggling. But now you've got a lot more teams on that upper tier of kind of national just implications in playing. And you've got a lot of teams now that are looking to play some postseason ball. So the pack right now is definitely a, a really strong conference to be a part of. Yeah, and uh, I remember 
in the summer we kind of talked about like the strength of conferences and we may have left them out and that was uh that was our mistake that's all right sure. we're here to rectify that we might this yeah. this off season it'll be fun to go through and actually do like a power ranking of like conference by conference would be like a fun a fun deal for each level of football Man, I just hope we're still doing the show, man. After yeah. last week, after last week, I was getting worried we were going to be done after this year. Yeah, right. Come on. Oh, uh, you know, I'm just busting your balls. Man. Yep. Busting no, balls. life happens, but uh, this is this is far yeah. too much fun uh, doing this and talking ball to to just give up on it, my friend. But um, let's move over. Talk about another game here. We've got um, Utica taking on uh, Morrisville, twenty-eight twenty-six. The Mustangs, correct, I believe, take this one. Yes, the Mustangs take this one. Talk about, uh, you know, why you had this one kind of highlighted. I mean, for there's one blatantly obvious <laughs> reason why is because Utica caught a touchdown as time expired, yeah. down 28-20, and they did not convert the two-point conversion. Yeah. Like, you get this crazy touchdown that to think, oh, we just got, you still got to get the two-point conversion. Like, you get, you're at the hard part, and now, oh, oh it's got to be so brutal. That is because tough. the Empire, the Empire Eight is a tough conference. You got Cortland at the top. Man, oh man, that's a tough one for you to call. I think that was their second loss of the year too. So their playoff hopes are probably dwindling. But uh, they, uh, they'll host Alfred next week and they'll more than likely get a victory. But at any given Saturday, you know, one hundred percent. Yeah, I know you talk about conference kind of strength right now. The Empire Eight, as it stands, you mentioned the obvious favorite in Cortland, four and zero right now in conference, six and zero overall. But then you go down the list: Brockport, certainly right there, five and one overall, three and zero in conference right now. Those two on a collision course to see who will end up taking this one. Brockport's defense and defensive secondary has been kind of a calling card of their team the last couple of years. After that, it does drop off. Uh, Morrisville right there in the hunt at three and three overall. They're two and one in conference, so could have some things you know go their way. Alfred, no pushover, but right now struggling inside of conference play. And it's, you know, the depth of the Empire 8 is is not necessarily there right now. Nonetheless, a, a really big win for that Morrisville squad. And uh, also worth noting, nobody melted on the black turf. <laughs> oh, man. Come on, dude. <laughs> Other quick hitters for us here. D3 wise, number five, Harden Simmons. They hold on versus McMurray. McMurray four and one heading into this game. I did not know that. I, I not a team that we've talked about enough on this show. 17 to 12. Harden Simmons wins by five. They eke by, if you will, after a uh, a really big time win last week over UMHB. That felt like it could have been the time to strike. Obviously, coming off a big emotional win. Sometimes there's a letdown that immediately follows. Yeah, I mean, you never want to have a letdown. You just cannot have that. You keep going, though. Talk WIAC action. Whitewater, they do find some big offense. 66 nothing shutout of UW-Stevens point. And then one that I did want to talk about a little bit here, Johns Hopkins. They're tested in a 13-6 to win over Franklin and Marshall. The Blue Jays still sitting at 5-1. and Feels like a lot of people counting them out. Um, not saying they won't be a you know postseason-type team or even compete for the conference, but counting them out of the national picture. It does feel like that's been part of the conversation. And... There are some reasons why. We look at the stats from last year compared to this year. A year ago, this Johns Hopkins squad is averaging over 40 points a game. This year, it's down to 23. And offensively, you're down 140 yards per game. When you look at this offense for Johns Hopkins, they were dominating the run and passing attack last year and really the time of possession. Like That was something that they absolutely owned most opponents on. They were but, really uh, efficient in the run. Too, for like their red zone touchdown percentage is like absurd. It was like 45 for 59 or something last year. That is ridiculous. That's a big reason why they were a one seed heading into the playoff. But uh, the cliff note I had at the bottom of that, Jimmy, is that they're still winning games and they're finding yeah. ways to win games, maybe a little yeah. bit unconventionally compared to what they've done in the past. But the winning DNA is still very much in the water or in the air, I suppose, for the Blue Jays. Could be in the water, too. It could be both. <laughs> Finally, um, Catholic, take a close one over. Uh, is it lie coming? I have no idea. It's a tough one. That's a tough one. Yeah, I gotta I get. No, I gotta get right. That's on me. <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be better. I gotta get right on the pronunciation. Uh, either way, it looked like a good ball game. 14-12. Catholic takes that one. That was kind of the the last cliff note for me as as far as some some big time games that stood out, my friend. Yeah, that I remember the the Mullenberg game was pretty crazy. There was like a hundred points in that game. It was like oh, fifty eight yeah. to forty two or something like that. It's pretty wild. Yeah. So is it? By the way, Mullenberg or Muhlenberg? I believe Mule. Muhlenberg. Pardon me. I believe. Me. Um, and you talk about Johns Hopkins. I think that's as far as, you know, that conference is concerned, those two will meet to decide who ends up taking that automatic bid here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, more than likely so. 
Yeah. So awesome, my man. Appreciate you joining me again. Good Always to happy to do it, Kobe. Always happy. I oh, was yeah. I was bummed last week. I had, I had my good friend Stutzy, the juice man over at uh, Style, the running backs coach. He was really looking forward to the, last week's episode. Obviously, I know. With, with Whitewater. But uh, shout out to Stutzy. He's always listening. So I love yeah, it. happy to hear the shout out. So. Shout out to him, man. I appreciate it. All right, yeah, Jim. Yeah. Have a good rest of your night, dude. All right. Take care. All right, big thank you to Jimmy for coming on here, coming from D3 Ball. And uh, no match wars tonight, so hang with me as I as I go through some quick NAIA coverage. And I think let's start things off with a new top 10 in the NAIA scene. And here you go. Kaiser, still on top. No reason why they should be taken off. They've proved it week in and week out they belong there. So is Grandview, though. And you can notice that uh, they're right behind them. That Grandview Viking squad has been playing an incredible clip. Indiana Wesleyan, Dort, St. Thomas still up there even after the loss to number one. Montana Western has looked really, really solid these last couple of weeks. Benedictine, Nor Morningside, Northwestern, and Southern Oregon round out the top 10 teams in the NAIA right now per the NAIA. I mean, we don't really do the rankings over here at D1R. We just talk about them. So those are your top 10 heading into this week for the NAIA. And I'd be remiss if I did not talk about, and we posted it on our socials, but this is a finish that we have to talk about. Southwestern playing Friends University and... I mean, for the win, they line up for this kick, and I'm just going to play the clip and show you exactly what happened. Talk about just the right place, right time. The kick gets blocked, and here's Geddes right there. I'm talking in stride for the Falcons from Friends University. He takes it all the way back. Friends wins at the end of regulation that game absolutely ridiculous. You see the reaction from Friends University there. They got a good thing going down there, and I do believe Kansas. Um, what a finish for the Friends Falcons, man. I love – every time I can get to talk about Friends is like the coolest thing. I think this is the coolest cool, uh, school name on the show. Um, but our game of the week for this week actually was not that. I thought it might be, but then I, I learned a little something about this St. Francis-St. Xavier game – St. Xavier game, excuse me – St. Francis beats the Cougars for the first time since 2009. That felt like a really important stat. So here's some highlights from the game that we cut up in our uh, Game of the Week post here. And uh, some cliff notes on this one. I mean, St. Francis was down, and they scored 22 unanswered points, I believe was the stat. Uh, 22, or maybe it was like they were down 22 nothing. Hold on, I got I to gotta verify before I just uh, start spouting out some of these numbers. Sorry, yes, down 22 to nothing, and they would go on and score and really come back into this one into overtime to win this game. What a win for this St. Francis squad. And uh, St. Xavier's been handed a couple of tough losses these last couple of weeks. Look at that Indiana Wesleyan game and now the St. Francis game. But uh, right now, the Fighting Saints, 5-1 and one on the year. Their one loss was to Indiana Wesleyan inside of uh, – MSFA conference play right now. They're one and zero, so some really big games still on the horizon for them. You've got St. Francis, Indiana. You've got Olivet Nazarene has been putting up some really good competition. Number seven Marion to close out the year, but this felt like a, a rather deserving game of the week selection just for what it meant for this St. Francis season and how they were able to overcome some pretty insurmountable or seemingly insurmountable odds. So I had to mention that. Uh, speaking of a couple of those teams. Marion and Olivet Nazarene, 45-40. to 40. Marion ekes this one out to keep uh, one of their top 25 spots alive. And this is an offensive explosion from both teams. Jack Miller for ONU, 23 for 38, 356 and four touchdowns. Did have two interceptions through the air. Tristan Polk for Marion at 347 and a tud through the air as well. Marion, I think what separated them, a little bit better on the ground game. Had 198 yards on the ground to just 54 of Olivet Nazarene. But uh, you talk about a guy who had a day offensively. Jake Richard, I'm hopefully pronouncing that one correctly. 10 catches, 249 yards and a touchdown. For the receiver from Marion. That is incredible. Seriously. Um, otherwise, though, going and looking at some uh, some other big-time NAIA games, McPherson is maybe a team that we need to talk about more on this particular program. The Bulldogs take down Bethel 35-10. to They're on a six-game win streak right now. And again, that feels like something that is worth discussing. This Mac, uh, McPherson team, excuse me, is absolutely rolling and this was done in, I wouldn't say a dominant fashion, 
so to speak. Um, you know, going into halftime, this game was eight to three. They led, or excuse me, fifteen to three. So it wasn't like anything ridiculous. Their defense playing out of their mind, but thirty-five to ten is a pretty a pretty solid score for this McPherson squad. You look defensively, some of the bigger individual efforts for them. Avery Crawford had an interception on the day. Uh, they were led by Brandon Jones with ten tackles and a half a TFL, two sacks from Jaquez Wilson. So some big time performances there for the Bulldogs. And looking at their schedule moving forward, hold on here. There it is. Looking at their schedule moving forward for this McPherson squad, they're 6-1 and one right now. They're lost the uh, opening week at Tabor College. They've got a lot of things going for them right now, and that's their only loss. I mean, the KCAC is not playing any out-of-conference games, but they're 6-1, and one, which means they're 6-1 and one in the KCAC. But you've got some of the heavy hitters uh, still coming up. Evangel, Friends, Southwestern, those three teams line the back end of the schedule. But if you're McPherson... You control your own destiny still, which is all that some teams can act for, ask for Excuse me, at this stage of the game. Some other quick hitters. NAI, before we wrap things up. Ottawa, Kansas, they outlast St. Mary 33-30. to Lindsey Wilson takes down Campbellsville 16-10. to That was a pretty highly anticipated matchup. The Tigers have been on an absolute tear this season. They get stumped there. Texas College wins in overtime versus Louisiana Christian, 40-34. Georgetown, they beat Cumberland, 14-9. And then some frontier results for you. Carroll, they take down Eastern Oregon, 24-19. And Montana Western takes down Rocky Mountain, 42-24. A dominant run game for the Bulldogs out there. Montana Western feels like could spell success heading towards the postseason. But uh, those are the big ones tonight. I really appreciate you all tuning in and uh, be on the lookout. Check out the socials. We have a lot of great stuff coming over the next uh, couple weeks here at D1R.